Folks, I hate that I have to say something that is this self-evident, something that is so clear to me and anybody with eyes, but I'm still gonna say it and I would invite you to say it with me. This right here is the country with the best people, the best food and the very best countryside. I am of course talking of Brazil, the best country in South America, yes, even the best country in the world that we are now going to play in this roleplay playthrough in Victoria 3. Now just, a now just as a heads up, obviously this is modded because this beautiful map is not a part of the base game but there is much much more modded. If you're interested in what I'm playing with, if you want to play with that as well, then go check out the link in the description, you can follow that, it's a playlist and you will see every single mod that I am also using. Today we're going to jump in with this Victoria Tweaks mod with a couple of other mods and of course with this beautiful beautiful map graphic. Now as with all playthroughs on this channel, this will be an incredibly roleplay heavy playthrough. I have played grand strategy games since 2005 and I am tired of min-maxing, I've done enough for about three or four lifetimes. Instead, we're going to really dive into the history of what is going on here. We're going to talk about it, of course, here in this video and future videos. And I would invite every single Brazilian to leave comments if I overlook stuff, if I interpreted stuff that I read about your country's history wrongly, and so on and so forth. Because I'm going to be honest with you, it is your duty. My God, how do all of you keep the amazing history that your country has in the Victorian period secret? That is a disaster. Let me just tell you this. When I looked up, for example, all the people that are active in Brazilian politics, every single one of these historical characters, I thought to myself, what the hell is going on? I've never heard about any of this, but it's so damn interesting. So I hope that you can forgive me if we just take a moment to check everything out and to just understand where we are as Brazil. Because man, this is not an old country. This country, of course, has been settled ages ago by the Portuguese. It was settled in the uh, treaty by the Pope, you know, between Portugal and Spain. I believe they cut it like somewhere here, something like this anyway. And now we're looking at a newly founded nation. And I mean, newly founded is pretty accurate. It only gained independence in 1821 after the United Kingdom between Portugal and Brazil split on succession. We're looking at a country that is not just young, but also had had a very tumultuous past. In 1821 you get independence, in 1823 the empire, uh, emperor Pedro I says hey let's convene, let's settle on a constitution and we go from there. Because you have to understand, this was a country founded by of course the elite, but the elite was following enlightenment ideas. They all looked at the French Revolution and were like that's interesting. It wasn't that cool that Napoleon then came and kicked us out, but that's a different topic. So they came together, wanted to write a constitution and then kind of squandered it, never actually finished it. And Pedro I said I'm gonna dissolve this whole convent, forget about it. I'm gonna instead pass a very centralized constitution that gives the emperor a pretty decent chunk of power. The emperor Emperor is of course the head of the executive and with that, hey, he has to push everything through. He is the will of the Brazilian people and the Brazilian nation. Which brings us to our current problem. Emperor Pedro II de Braganza is, you know, he hasn't reached the age of majority. How can you have a strong and good executive if this guy is a child? This guy's 10 years old, I mean, my god. That is exactly the drama, the issue that we are currently looking at here in Brazil in 1836. 1821, independence. 1823, they try to get a proper constitution. 1824, Pedro I says, forget about that, here's my own constitution. And then in 1831, he gets ousted. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves in this exact Regency period. And that is really, really interesting, because this Regency period is a time of crisis. Our current actual uh, regent right here, the Yoga Antonio Feijo, isn't the first regent. There have been a couple of others before that, and there was even one after him. But what matters is that there is no strong executive. It's interesting, and it's really cool that he is the very first executive in Brazilian history that was actually voted in. He is regent by the power of this parliament right here. You can see the separation between the opposition and the regency because well yeah they're all in opposition as long as this regency still lasts and um, that is all cool and all but we had a rebellion right here we would have another one later actually under Sabino I believe is his name uh, let me check the guy there he is yeah Francesco Sabino never really plays a big role in Victoria 3 here but this guy started a rebellion against slavery we had several rebellions right here as well and we have two rebellions going on right now Grau Para is going on because these people are incredibly poor before the Brazilian Empire was founded, these people were even independent in their administrative region and now are obviously incredibly unhappy that they are governed in a fairly centralized Brazilian government. But these people rebelled for poverty. The people down here are rebelling because they are saying we are the landowners of these lands and we should have more autonomy, if not independence altogether from the Brazilian Empire. 
And that is why they are rebelling. So, well, yeah, you know, strong executive. <laughs> if you're a child, you don't really get that. But of course, the struggle between the central authority of the empire and the decentralized authority of the stakeholders in this empire isn't the only struggle that is currently being fought. The matter of slavery is a huge point. Pedro II grew up and he was basically groomed to rule to an unbelievable degree, really taught what his duties were and would then go on to live out his duties as well as he could. Fairly popular actually in the population. Uh, but what matters here is that you always wanted slavery to be toned down to maybe even make be made illegal. But of course it's not that easy if your economy quite literally depends on this. Look at this. 25% of our population are slaves. 57% of our population are Afro-Brazilian, which just for the record are actually being discriminated in this Brazil right here. This is an unbelievable dissonance between this enlightened aristocracy and also the petite bourgeoisie and then the reality of what was without a doubt an indentured servitude to slavery state and well, one of the last states to, will, uh, to still very actively and aggressively practice indeed the Atlantic slave trade. This is a cool journal entry because there is one that corresponds to this one in Britain. They have a button that says, I will screw you Brazil, I hate you. And you're going to see that in action, I think, in due time. What we can do is selectively enforce the ban and we can issue the golden law. Basically, the goal here is keep this journal entry open until you can try and pass slavery banned without ruining the reputation of the emperor. Uh, all of these reasons here make it so that we tick up uh, every month. We're not going to see a lot of upticks here because you can see not have uh, slave trade law, intelligentsia and government, landowners are marginalized. Brazil is actively suppressing the slave trade. This would be this right there. Uh, and then... Yeah, Pedro II has been crowned as emperor, so once we get more stability, we can move against this law. But until then, uh, yeah, negative conditions. Landowners powerful in government. The regency period is ongoing. The leader of Brazil belongs to the landowners or is a slaver. The majority of Brazilian commanders belong to the landowners or have the slaver ideology. The idea here is that we quietly and subtly for decades may want to work if Pedro II stays in power against the slavers. But if we go too harshly, this will, you know, without a doubt, spark some, some issues. Because you can see right here, if you ban slavery, this actually makes this journal entries bar go down. And if this bar goes below 50, below 60% actually, and Pedro II dies, the monarchy will end in a coup of the landowners. Let me just connect this for you. We have a fight between slavers and anti-slavers. We have a fight between central authority and decentralized authority. And this is reflected in this journal entry right here, the slavery issue. And the more we escalate this, the less do people trust us with power. And the less people trust us with power, the more rampant becomes the undermining of the monarchy. Uh, let's take a look at this. Pedro II's male heirs have died, so these are all negative factors. Pedro II's health is in decline, rejected or failed the Republican proposal. We're going to see that if it comes to that. Brazil has slavery banned. Again, this is negative because if we do slavery banned, it is a huge break with the land-owning class in our country. The armed forces or the landowners are powerful and not in government, while support for the monarchy is at or below 30%. If you're already brittle, not having them in government to lend us some legitimacy will make it even worse. Brazil does not have have tenant uh, farmers or serfdom. Again, if we take their power, their backing will move away. Failed the ragamuffin war journal entry. That's, I, I'm not failing that, forget about it. Failed the integrating of the Brazilian nation journal entry and Brazil is in default or has declared bankruptcy. And then the last one is interesting. Any revolution has progressed above 50% progress. Because this one means, even if they don't rebe rebel in the end, if there is such a strong push against the rule, this will destabilize us. Now, while this may change depending on how it goes, my current goal will be to hopefully maintain and retain the empire. I would like, different from history, to have the empire last longer than this child's life. Pedro II de Braganza hopefully ushers in a new glorious era of an enlightened monarchy here in Brazil. But just be aware, this is a roleplay playthrough. If we fail this or if it makes sense to fail it, then we just might. And we might go deeper into the slavery Republican direction. The last one here that I want to take a look at is integrating the Brazilian nations. This one is really, really interesting because right now we just aren't really a nation. Brazil has been ruled as a colony for its entire existence until 1821 and all of a sudden they said, you are a nation now, my friend. But what the hell does that mean? We already have a couple of Brazilians, but the other important factors of European, uh, uh, you can see it right here, there you go, of European heritage cultures are Nordestino, Paulista, Sulista, and Amazonic. 
all of these need to be convinced that we should be one Brazilian nation. And for each of these, we basically have two options. Let's take a look at this right here. We can either do what they want, which is to, for example, for the Nordestinos, an ex-slavery band. Again, I told you, uh, Nordestinos, or the Northeasterners, they had anti-slavery rebellions. The Sabinos, or, well, the followers of Sabino right here, they were in a position where in 1837 they actually rebelled in the name of an anti-slavery rebellion. So we can either give them what they want, or we can unify them behind our propaganda if we get a regional national hero. We get this if we wage some wars, you know, are successful and have a good time. That is essentially something we can do for every culture or again we fulfill their requirement. Right here for the Solistas, for example, we have to go on and defeat the Rio Grandense Republic and then make sure the cultural turmoil goes down below 10%. The Paulistas are the river of coffee journal entries, so we need to get that river of coffee really flowing. And then the other one, the Amazonics, basically, well, you're gonna see this. They also want their devastation reduced and they also want to be below 10% cultural turmoil. Those are the things that we need to do. We need to decide. On what the future of slavery is, we need to decide whether we want a strong constitutional authority, a strong executive in the eyes and the hands of the emperor, or whether we might want a, you know, maybe backwards republic. And then, last but not least, we have to actually build a nation. <sighs> All of these were challenges that Brazil indeed faced, and historically speaking, it's a mixed bag. I mean, they definitely just had the slavery republican coup. They did get rid of slavery, but... Yeah, Pedro II basically was ousted and he just said, I'm tired of this, just let me go. It's, it's fine, it is what it is. But that ended the empire very unceremoniously. At the same time, the matter of slavery was a contentious one. The Ragamuffin War and the agitation between the different areas in Brazil would last for decades. The question is just, can we do it better? Well, you know what's going on there. All right, but we are not quite finished with the introduction because I told you that Brazil is insanely rich in the history in this era and, well, the Brazilians haven't told us anything about this until Victoria III has now actually done it. This man right here is very interesting. Diogo Antonio Feijo, he is a good man. He is a man that wasn't a friend of slavery. He basically is the default of everything going on right here with the intelligentsia. But he wasn't all too tactful. He didn't really, you know, able to navigate and to mediate between the different factions in the Brazilian parliament. We can see it right here, the moderate party and the exalted liberal party, the centralists and the federalists, the people that like slavery and the people that don't like slavery all that much. He didn't like slavery in his period as a regent. He tried to get rid of it and... I mean, you guessed it, he got ousted for it. This is exactly how precarious this position is. At the same time, as already mentioned, Francisco Sabino, he also wanted to follow the ideas of the French Revolution, the French Enlightenment period. He's a radical and he wants to get rid of slavery. He wants to indeed also get rid of, well, anything that isn't just freedom for the peoples of Brazil. Uh, in Gotta Tell You, in my test runs here, this guy never actually does anything. Again, historically, in 1837, had a tiny rebellion right here. I don't think we're going to be seeing this right here. Now, the moderate party is interesting because, again, normally in playthroughs, you would say the landowners need to go, go, go. But our fate is tied to basically balance the scales here. Yes, we want to weaken them, but never to such a degree that they get too agitated. And this is interesting to me because the landowners are actually somebody that I really want to make happy. Take a look at this right here. Fazenda Ibicaba, plus 20% migration attraction. Oh my god. If you just get them to plus five and then uh, to at least three, so once they are at five, right, it needs to be just three, you can make it so that you get plus 20% migration attraction. It's great. And I looked this up actually. Fazenda Ibicaba is a location where, and I, I kid you not, okay, where they paid for European settlers, mostly Germanic settlers, so, you know, the, the uh, North Germanics and then, of course, the Germans, uh, to settle and essentially to become indentured servants. They would owe the landowners money, then they would have to work for them and would be in a debt spiral. Classic stuff. So much so that in 1856, after an uprising in that location, Prussia actually forbade its citizens to migrate close to Sao Paulo. Uh, I think, so since that is Sao Paulo, uh, the Fazenda Ibicaba must have been somewhere here, right? But interesting story. So I want to actually please the landowners. Yes, they're slavers. Yes, I want to get rid of that. Maybe eventually. Our emperor certainly doesn't like it. But hey, let's bait some of these Germans to live in our farms and be indentured servants. Hello? That's a great deal. We also have latifundios, which makes it so that we get agricultural and plantation tax income, which is huge. Because, well, our economy will be cash crop central. 
Ha. Then on top of this, we have the leader, Aureliano da Sousa e Oliveira Coutinho. And he is really interesting. I looked at his, uh, at his actual Wikipedia entry on in Portuguese, translated obviously, I don't speak Portuguese. And this guy apparently had a really positive reputation amongst the people that were poor and even the slaves. Yes, he's a landowner, but it doesn't seem that he was too eager to continue the uh, transatlantic slave trade. So, yep, he seems to be a moderate and in general quite well liked. He's a charismatic guy, he built a couple of things. I think he was even involved in uh, creating educational institutions. Again, you need to remember, different from the landowners over here, where they very proactively wanted to stop their people from reading, Brazil was kind of trying to be enlightened, kind of trying to be different. Ha, and he is indeed very interesting. He wanted a strong empire, he wanted maybe slavery, the status quo preserved, but in the end not in a terrible state. Now this guy right here, Joao Paulo dos Santos Barreto, I didn't find too much on him. He was a military leader, he was a good guy, he was like, I love the emperor, and well, there you go, right? Good for him, definitely fits the mark of the conservative party right here. Then we have the petite bourgeoisie, and they are also rather interesting. I don't think they have a different trait. Nope, that is exactly the same, but we have Bernardo Pereira de Vasconcelos. And he was really important in maintaining Brazilian stability. He was not a friend, as I understand it, of the current regent, but he was in a position where he was basically saying, obviously, we need to become the beacon of liberty under the monarchy here. Uh, he was not in favor of declaring Pedro II, you're going to see this, there's an event for this, uh, to be of the age of majority before he actually was, which they did historically then indeed do. He wasn't in favor of this, but he wanted to get rid of the regent. He wanted maybe to be a bit less... Uh, uh, centralized, a bit more federalized, but most importantly, he actually, if I recall this correctly, quelled some of the rebellions going on in this time period, in particular, I think in Minas Gerais. I, I think that was him, if I'm not mistaken here. Now, Januario da Cuna Barbosa was the most important, or one of the most important poets and philosophers of Brazil in this region, and he is also kind of like a you know, a relic of a bygone era. He is a person that was there when the independence happened. He fought for independence. He wanted a new Brazil, a new era, and of course the enlightened monarchy as we've already talked about. But yeah, I mean, I think historically actually would only be 55 at this point. I, I think the, the birth date here is wrong. I, I've only found him as 78, but doesn't 1780, but doesn't really matter. The point here is he is kind of a product of a bygone era because he had his heyday in the period where, of course, Pedro the first was ruling. Uh, he also kind of, you know, had like a difficult position when it comes to the monarchy as a whole. But that is mostly because Pedro the first was it, it could be a bit of a, you know, a son of a gun. Now, the second to last important person that I want to talk about is Martin Francesco Ribeiro de Andrada e Silva. The e Silva here is omitted, but he is so, so important because he is one of three brothers that dominated Brazilian politics in this era. Uh, I forgot the name of the second brother, but the first brother, Bonifacio, was essentially the kingmaker previously to this game's start. He also then got ousted and had to live in Bordeaux, which is a terrible fate, uh, although I think he actually moved back to Brazil in 1836 and then passed away in 1838. But Bonifacio was a hero. He was named the Patriarch of Independence because that is exactly what he achieved. He made that happen. He made a strong Brazilian centralized state happen. Martin is not quite as important, but he was incredibly vital to get an, you know, for example, a system where you have education, where you have constitutionalist monarchies uh, running and all that sort of stuff. He was involved in this and played a really, really important role. I bring this up because he is technically a really boring moderate, but I don't really think that that does him justice. Anyway, last but not least, we have the rural folk, and this is really funny to me because, uh, they also have a trait that is very, very important for migration, Nucleus Coloniais, so you can see if we get them to be over 20% and the landowners are over 20%, we would get 50% migration attraction in total because this value would double, which is massive. That is how you outcompete the United States of America for migration. But anyway, uh, Nucleus Coloniais, uh, Coloniais is actually the state-sponsored colonial center policy of Brazil starting in like the 50s, but mostly ramping up in the 80s. That is when Brazil got most of its uh, migration. This guy, Nicolau Pereira de Campos Vergero, definitely not how you pronounce it, by the way. He actually, <laughs> I find it so funny. He's actually the guy that ran Fazenda Ibica. Ibicaba. He is the guy that is responsible for the indentured servitude there, for the rebellion, and then he died, and the whole business kind of shrank and died. He's, he's here. 
I mean, what can you say? He's a very ambitious man, no, not a lot of people liked him, but yeah, obviously, this means that the landowners and the rural folk, different from almost every other country in this game, will be crazy important, because I want migrants. I am playing with Victoria Tweaks mod, and what I just showed you is so, so important to me, because what it means is that if we agitate the landowners too much, then I can't go through with this, because we will be failing Magnanimous Monarch. If we agitate the old order too much while, you know, not building a new order, if we fail to go ahead and integrate all the nations, all these things, I will lose the favor of both the landowners for the monarchy and, of course, also of the rural folk. And I need their favor, because, oh my god, they have great modifiers. My point here is, we will play a much more cautious game. Instead of trying to erode the power of the landowners, I will try to cooperate with them. I will try to work with them. And oh my god, that is a long, long introduction, but I am so in love with Brazilian history in this period. Just for the record again, if you're Brazilian, if you have any secrets about your history that you want to tell us, feel free to do so in the comments. I love what I have seen, and I'm all the more interested to continue further. But with that being said, um, we are uh, currently looking at an illegitimate government. Technically, I could take others in, but I'm going to let this regency run. Uh, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to become legitimate by lowering taxes. I don't think I'm going to go deeper into consumption taxes. What I want to do instead is work towards uh, greener... Yep, there we go. So I want people to come to Sao Paulo and Minas Gerais. This is where people went historically as well, because that is just where most of the arable land is. That is where the landowners were very, very powerful. And you can see this here as well, where we have a lot of, a lot of potential when it comes to what we can get in modifiers. Coffee plantation throughput with Terra Rocha. Uh, Roxa? Rocha? I'm not sure. But you can see right here, that is this entire area up to Mato Grosso. Then we have Mata Atlantica. A sugar plantation throughput goes up as well. That is the entire coastline. And then we have the Parana River, which gives us Mappy, which is huge in VTM, and additional infrastructure. Uh, right here, I'm also very interested in this one. Pantana, look at that. Agriculture throughput and plantations throughput up. This right here, the south, is the area that I want to focus on. What do we have up here? Yes, a tower. I mean, ranches are good, but I don't think they can compete with this right here. Oh, uh, no, no, I think Pampas is still better, right? We, we should be in a position where we can run mostly... Yeah, I think these are all the states that we care about. So that means, indeed, we want to have our... Uh, uh, where, where are they? There they are. Greener grass campaigns right here to attract as many migrants as we can. On top of that, I do love promote national values, but I don't think it matters that much at the, at the moment. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and actually put emergency reliefs here, because if I pay people to live there... It will bring up the overall standard of living, which also, yet again, brings up the migration attraction. So let's put this on both of these. It's really weird to create usage here, but I'm going to continue doing it. And then I'm going to bring up encourage agricultural industry. And you know what? I'm thinking about this now. I ooh, yeah, you know what? I'm going to be I'm going to play it crazy. I'm going to put this is the pearl of the empire. OK, <laughs> I'm going to get rid of all my financing. These are the days of trying to get as many people to migrate as possible. Uh, this still needs to recalculate. We are at 50 now. We can get that to be higher. Now, in terms of research, I'm going to be honest with you. I would really like everything related to egalitarianism, just because that is, of course, the enlightenment that we are so, so much after. Ah, but at the same time, Hmm. You know, I, I am really kind of looking forward to this right here. Intensive agriculture isn't bad because this will make it so that we can yet again move much, much further. Ah, but now I'm looking at this. We're mostly working with plantations. This actually isn't that huge if you're going for plantations primarily. So you know what? I'm going to hold off of this and maybe, you know what? Yeah, screw it. Let's go for egalitarianism and after that for dialectics. We're going to go for liberalism wherever we can. Now we do also, of course, have these separatist revolts going on here because they were literally starving and they weren't having a great time. And here because the landowners were saying, I should have autonomy and how I rule my fiefdom. Both of them need to be defended and, you know, defeated, but... Obviously, this one is way more threatening to the status quo. If we want to play nice with everything going on when it comes to the landowners, I think I want to, you know, destroy that rebellion first. And let me just take a look at this right here. I could hire... Oh, actually, wait a minute. Let me just double check this. No, okay, you have a commander. John Grenfell. Take a look at that. It's an Englishman in the service of the Brazilian crown. I absolutely love it. I like Hermes de Braganza, but I do like the reckless advance in woodland combat. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to hire Floriano. 
Oh, I'm not gonna hire you because you're a landowner. I am gonna hire the armed forces guy. Okay, there you go. And then I'm gonna make him ready to actually, you know, kind of get the manpower that he needs to overthrow the rebellions right here. I'm gonna immediately mobilize him, raise the conscripts, and then we're gonna wait here, whereas the other two armies here will simply be set to defend. I think they can hold, hopefully. Um, we're not gonna attack on our own terms. And then when this army is ready, we're first gonna destroy this rebellion and then down here, the Rio Grandense Republic. Now, in terms of building, as I said, oh, and I don't like that at all. Yeah, this this negative infrastructure here, that's that's worrisome. We need some tech here to naturally increase our infrastructure limitation. We're doing fine here, and I think we're going to continue to do fine going forward. It's plus 14 currently. I'm going to build a couple of construction sectors here. I don't want to go too deep. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm trying a new strategy here, an interesting strategy where... I try to, normally, you go maximum taxes so that you can maximize your, uh, your initial growth. I kind of want to not do that because in VTM you can get massive, massive population waves and if we snag enough from the United States, we may get just enough in taxes from peasants, uh, you know, that we have a pretty good start, even if we don't go super hard on taxing everybody and then investing it. The higher our standard of living, the more are we capable of taking away from the United States. Right, anyway, we're gonna do this, and then I would like to move towards something that the Europeans already need. They currently don't really need coffee plantations. I do think tobacco plantations should be pretty good. Ah, uh, oh, only Minas Gerais, huh? We could do coffee right here, obviously. Hmm. I'm gonna do dyes in Sao Paulo for the time being. Let's build a couple of dye plantations. More workspace means more migration attraction. Yeah, and there they are. Battle in Maranhao. They are attacking what we are defending very well with General Pierre Labatou, who is French and also serving the Empire. General Manuel Lopez here will indeed perish. Ooh, and take a look at that. The Empress Regency. The triumvirate regency of the landowners and the armed forces was recently overthrown and replaced by the democratically selected Feo Regency. Again, this is the very first democratically elected uh, executive in Brazil's history. Until Emperor Pedro comes of age, Brazil will likely be engulfed by political turmoil. Chess, lauded as the Game of Kings for over a thousand years, stresses strategic acumen. Long strategies require sacrifice, cost calculation, and a keen sense of literacy. And as one pay a player slips, another gains control of the board. Now the board of this game was the young emperor himself. Who knows what scars this, these intrigues would leave on a boy. Will they never cease their squabbling? The intelligentsia under Feho will be unwilling to join political parties until the regency period has concluded. And yeah, minus 15 legitimacy. I, I'm immediately illegitimate again. I can, I might as well just reset Texas, I guess. Because just the way this is looking, I'm not going to be legitimate anyway. And quite frankly, yeah, that sounds about right. You know, looking at history, he didn't get much done. He was disposed in two years' time, I think. Ooh, and we are losing here. I assume, yeah, that the noblemen, they actually have lances. They are bringing their best and... Uh, oh, and I forgot to set any mobilization options. You know what? We gotta, we gotta do that. Mobilization options are so important in this game now. I like to do it from this screen, though. Uh, we're producing tobacco, we're producing this. What is this again? This is liquor. I, I think I can pay for all of this. We're not going to do the, the marches here. I'm primarily just looking at more morale recovery so that we don't lose our fights. How are you going in terms of recruiting troops? You're already at 5k. That is really, really good. We just got to speed it up here. Oh, and I got to upgrade this infantry. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah, let's make sure that we have uh, basically this army cleaning up everything that needs to be cleaned up. And look at that. The French are indeed already cleaning up Algeria. And the British are responding to the opium ban. I think we're going to see an invasion of the Great Qing right here. In my experience, the Great Qing doesn't really stand much of a chance against the British because, well, they just have way better troops. And oh my god, I set this trap for myself. I made Britain to be more willing to enforce this because otherwise... Otherwise, it would be so boring. And now here we are, and it's gonna get nasty. The Aberdeen Act. Outraged by the failure of Brazil to outlaw the slave trade, Great Britain has committed to enforcing the Aberdeen Act. British vessels will routinely patrol Brazilian shipping routes to disrupt trade. The Anti-Slavery Station. This squadron was really important. Not necessarily because they caught all of the slavery, you know, transports from Africa to Brazil. I believe the number is... Uh, I, I'm pretty sure we can't actually place the number, but I think it's like 25% of all transports. No, no, no. That's not what it's about, though. It's about the political pressure. You're going to see there will be real pressure here. 
A man is only as good as his word, so the old saying goes. An obligation, no matter how much small or seemingly insignificant, remains a promise. The breach of trust can, therefore, invite calamity. And here, now, a broken promise has roused a dragon to cripple a giant. Very concerning. Minus 50 opinion, minus 10% convoys, minus 25% trade route competitiveness, and pops in Brazil are more likely to support legacy slavery. You saw that we lose, uh, it's called Pedro points, but we lose points here in Magnanimous Monarch if we destabilize our rule by banning slavery. We can go towards legacy slavery. Maybe, potentially. Um, if there is ever a movement, I might want to consider it. At the same time though, slaves escape from Maranho plantations. More and more slaves have disappeared from the banana plantations in Maranho as of late, suspected by overseers of fleeing inland the yet undiscovered Quilombos, ex-slave settlements existing outside the reach of the law. Ooh, you know what? I actually wanna I wanna check this. We have a lot of Afro Brazilians living in this area. Um I wanna I wanna clarify something here. Are they just free peasants? Oh yeah, we, we got a couple of free peasants there, we got a couple of free laborers there. We very, very clearly have this exact distinction that this event's ta event is talking about. I love that. Senor, we're missing slaves. Seven did not report for headcount. Nobody's seen them. Three men, two women, and a boy and a girl. Anyone I uh, care to know? Meat is meat. It can be replaced. One of the strongest pickers. And one woman was someone your wife fancied. Should I round up some trackers? It is a, an absolutely disgusting practice. But we are not the monarch. The monarch might hear of this and he might say, wow, that is disgusting. That is not what I was taught in my European style education. But right now we need to appease the slave owners. Assemble hunting parties promptly. Uh, gets Colimbo destroyed, right? Plus one mortality. Um, this, whew, Jesus Christ. And act se uh, security measures to ensure this does not happen again. Ooh. Oh God. Thank the Lord for the slave markets of Sao Louis. We can just pay for replacements. Um... I think since he is, he wanted to get rid of slavery. I'm gonna say the region says we're just gonna we're gonna shell out the money. It's okay. And now here we also have interesting content. The fall of Salaveri. The defeat of Felipe Salaveri's coup attempt has led to complete consolidation of Bolivian domination over Peru. Supreme Protector Andres de Santa Cruz has declared the imminent formation of a confederation between the two nations. So that's that then. That the confederation is guaranteed. We already have one gluttonous neighbor. God help us all if they become, uh, if they both come for us. So, we will go for the confederation first. Send word to our friends and tell them to fix bayonets. This is the event that makes it so that we could potentially choose to disrupt Bolivia. And quite frankly, we might. We might want to disrupt them. Uh, now, well, technically they hold land of a state that you also hold, Bolivian Mato Grosso, and then right here, Bolivian Amazonas, but I'm gonna be honest with you, we have so much empty land, I don't think our population currently cares about this. Having an important opposing rival with banned slavery who could undermine our status quo. That could be difficult. That could be very, very difficult for us. Now, I will tell you, I couldn't find much on how Brazil felt about this confederation, historically speaking. I do know that they had, they didn't, so they weren't part of the war against the confederation. That was Argentina and Chile, and of course, Peru, but they had an ambassador in the capital of Bolivia, so I assume they kind of were fine with it. I'm gonna say, there's yet potential for a fruitful partnership. I do like this though, I gotta tell you, I do like this a lot. Add the peru Bolivian Confederation and then you get more diplomatic play uh, maneuvers and you get conscriptable battalions. I'm gonna keep this open. Right now, I don't think the regent is too interested in this. Uh, peru Bolivia, I mean, I'll be honest with you, if I power gamed this, I would definitely go against them just to splinter them because they have sulfur and we don't. And the weaker they are, the easier will I be able to get that sulfur long term. But right now, we don't care for sulfur. I'm just gonna say maybe we can work together. We have about 10 years to settle this if we ever need to. All right, but speaking of settling, Exercito Imperial Brasileiro is now ready. We shall march towards the north and we shall take Grau Para. We take them first and then we take the Rio Grandense Republic. And I, I told you, I told you it was gonna be nasty for us. Great Britain intercepts Brazilian slaver. 
A slave-carrying vessel flying the Brazilian merchant flag has been boarded by the Royal Navy of Congo, its human cargo seized and freed. The crew of the Paquete de Santos filed it out of the ship. While most were simply glad to be on Brazilian soil again, a handful set, out, uh, set about towards every other public house in Rio de Janeiro. But the next morning, they sought new work. Their reasoning was the same. None of them wanted a confrontation with the British. <sighs> again, this is a really, really interesting chapter. And the British efforts to get rid of this slave trade were legitimately a, a really, really interesting historical force. Now, the way we, rea we react to this is, is going to be difficult. We could say Perfidious Albion. <laughs> These penalties, dude. Ah, landowners, minus two approval. 75% chance of the not-so-bad option and 25% chance of minus 40% slave imports and minus 20% trade route competitiveness. Or they knew the risks such a voyage would entail where um, the aristocrats become a bit more radical. I will say Perfidious Albion. Um, I'm not gonna... We're currently working with the landowners. I'm not gonna work against them right now. Again, I love this modifier. <sighs> now, what we can do about this is we can selectively enforce the ban. This will make it so that we get the progress bar here increasing by one per month, but the landowners will significantly go against us. <sighs> I don't think I'm gonna do it right now. We are way too weak. We are unstable. You think I'm going to go ahead and selectively enforce the ban? The more we enforce this, of course, the less will Britain be agitated, but no, I'm going to ignore this right now. The status quo is, is bad enough as is. I don't want to make it worse. And just, I mean, just look at this. What the British are doing to us. Minus 25% trade or competitiveness right here, and then minus 20% additionally here. We are losing 45% competitiveness compared to any other person that imports or exports the same thing that we are. Slavery is a nasty business when the British are after you. I'll tell you that much. Plus, uh, yeah, we'll see about this. But you know what? Let's put all that aside and just enjoy that our marvelous, marvelous troops are marching north. We shall destroy this rebellion. I'm pretty sure they added... Yeah, look at that. They can now actually make this move right here as well. Outside of streets and so on. Once they reach the front line, we can probably destroy this rebellion. Ooh, this down here is... He's holding. He's having a tough time, Pedro, but he is holding. Anyway, this right here should now be a pretty clear victory. The XSC to Imperial Brasileiro is indeed advancing. And hopefully making it clear that no rebellion against the Emperor's right to rule shall ever be respected. Yeah, and just look how we are marching in here. I mean, there's not a lot going on here. If we take a look at the population, you can see 300k and 53k. This territory is easily conquered. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing. Nonetheless, it will have a massive, massive loss of life. And that is unavoidable. Because historically speaking, all the forces that were in Brazilian parliament, all the forces that were leading this war, were much less accepting. Oh, and they are embargoing us. Britain is embargoing us. Ah, yeah, I told you, this is going to be nasty, and I did this to myself, because I made the Aberdeen Act much more enforced by Britain. And yeah, we can see now that it is taking some nasty, nasty turns. Now, when it comes to uh, the actual liquor here, I think we can produce more of that ourselves, right? No, not with what we have here. Uh, do we not have any groceries? Nothing? Okay, um... We gotta see about producing that or getting it from other fo uh, sides. Anyway, we're looking at a rebellion that was just not really favored. Whereas this one, I mean, the landowners in power will understand that these landowners just wanted some more autonomy, right? So yeah, I think you're gonna see this in a second. All right, let me just try to reorientate ourselves. We can trade with the British. I think our natural friends are the Americans and probably the French. I'm gonna put an interest right here because this should give us the most interest, or well, the most overlapping interest with the most Europeans possible. This is the Rhine area is very, very important. Now, the way I see this is, um, I need to change who we're trading with. I need to import liquor for the time being. Long term, I would like to produce it at home. But yeah, we were getting that from the British, I guess. But I'll be honest with you, I know for a fact that these trade routes, <laughs> they're not gonna restart. The British hate us, and that is the way it is. Let's import some more liquor from elsewhere for the time being, and we'll continue onwards from there. Yeah, the Americans, look at the liquor we're importing. I mean, my God, I need to create new long-term trading partnerships because, man, our trade has been shot in the head, thanks to the British. And there they are. The crushing of the Cabernet. 
Despite the capitulation of the main Cabano government in Belém, countless rebel uh, rebels continue to resist the rule upstream. Hardened by years of brutal conflict, the Brazilian army has taken an especially harsh attitude towards the rebel bands, mainly comprised of free Afro-Brazilians and Amazonian fighters. Men, I need to tell you what a great victory this is. But the dreams of your beautiful wives and little sweets must wait. The rebel has escaped upstream, and he will fight until old age takes his fingers. A new orders are thus. Should they, hi should they hide behind trees, we will burn them down. Should they hide behind tall walls without tow holes, we will pile their dead and climb them. Leave no stone unturned, no grass untrod. In the name of God and House Braganza, onwards. No mercy for traitors, burn the rebel out. 90% devastation. 20% of Afro-Brazilian pops lose their lives, 20% of Amazonian pops lose their lives, and 10% of Amazonic pops do indeed lose their lives. Amazonas gets the scouring of the Amazon for five years, mortality goes up massively, pops become radical, and so on. Let me just take a, a quick look at this. 300,000 reduced to 251,000, now with 20,000 dying every year in excess mortality. It's a campaign of terror. But that is the campaign of the Empire. And I'm going to go on here, by the way. I'm going to station you in Brazil. I'm going to demobilize you. These are the forces. This is the man doing this. General Pierre Labatou does not have any mercy for the Amazonics, the Amazonians, or indeed the Afro-Brazilians. Now this guy right here, Exercito Imperial Brasileiro under General Hermes de Braganza. Oh, damn. He's a relative of ours. He is actually going to run this front line now. Let's push in the landowners as well. See, the important thing about this Republican movement actually is, and this is apparently true for Brazil until the empire fell, that Republicanism fundamentally was an elitist ideology. The way people saw the emperor was as this moderating force of liberty. And admittedly, again, Brazil had a unique role to play in this because it was the only location in South America that really tried to be liberal, that tried to be constitutionally sort of giving its people some rights and so on. But again, obviously, the elitist ideology won because, well, Pedro II got ousted. Now, this republic right here is an elitist republic. Don't forget that. And oh my god, it just got even worse. Great Britain seizes slaver in Brazilian waters. Not only are they embargoing us, not only are they enforcing the Aberdeen Act, not only are they taking down our trading ships at the coast of Africa, they are doing it in our waters. In the pursuit and capture of a Brazilian flagged slaver near Parana, a Royal Navy warship has violated the territorial uh, integrity of Brazil. Plantation owners and citizens alike are in uproar, calling for immediate action to be taken by the Brazilian government. And here we do have a news article. Britain strung up sovereign ship. In a perverse display of power, the British Royal Navy ship HMS Tweed has seized a trade ship off the coast of Brazil. This shocking breach of imperial sovereignty cannot be left unanswered. The terms of this distasteful law, the Aberdeen Act, dictate that any British ship may arrest and trial our own citizenships under as uh, citizens under British law. Why does our da -da -da -da, continued page two? So this right here. Uh, is something that caused a huge diplomatic crisis between Britain and Brazil historically. This was when uh, Pedro II was actually uh, quite a bit older, he was already a ruler, the regency had ended and so on, but this almost ended in war. At the end actually, the British ambassador sort of, you know, smoothed it all out and apologized. There was an actual apology by the British that they went too far, but that has to be said of course as well, he was against slavery, very much. He was kind of an ally of the British, it's just that he didn't have the power to do it until very late, and then it ended in the end of the monarchy. First they disrespect our flag, now our waters. <sighs> Legitimacy goes down, weakness in the face of Albion. Oh my god, that is a penalty right there. 2% of all pops become more radical, and uh, we get even more trade route competitiveness. We are getting owned here, left and right. We could also rattle our sabers at these insolent Brits. I can do this because my power projection is close enough to theirs here, essentially. We do want to build a navy, I, I can tell you that much. We only get it for two years. How long is it here? Also two years. Oh, so this, basically, it destroys our relationship even more. Let's be really, that relationship is gone. And it makes it so that we can't get this terrible one. I'm going to say rattle our sabers. Um, I think... Actually, no, I'm not going to say that. Our regency is incredibly weak. They disrespect our flag now, waters. No reaction. The emperor is a child. Nothing that can be done. 
Puh. Internal turmoil. Thy name is uh, everybody that is a slave owner. Yeah. Look at that spike. I hate the British. I, I really do. And then here, on the other side of the conflict, we have the end of the Landowner Rebellion, the Green Poncho Treaty. With the defeat of the Rio Grande's Republic Field Army, General Hermes de Braganza has proposed the granting of amnesties and extensive concessions to bring Rio Grande de Sul back into the fold and to avoid prolonged guerrilla fighting. This is the actual admiral, uh, the general that we just hired here. Interesting. General, my men have fought hard and bravely, but they are only men now. Far be it for us to treat each other, each other like Frenchmen with British prisoners. And if you must, then allow them a dignified death. Word left to me, Coronel, I can only guarantee that I shall speak to the ones who can spare them. If they have sense, they will see what I see. Farmhands, traders and artisans. This has to be highlighted. Here, we have a choice. The scouring of the Amazon? There was no choice. Because this is so disgusting to the political establishment of the Empire, Whereas this right here was landowners fighting for more autonomy in the eyes of the other landowners. Uh, I will offer concessions and full amnesty and the paying off of war debts. This is what happened historically. If they wanted leniency, they should have surrendered back in 1835. I'm gonna be honest with you, our rule, our, <laughs> our regency has been as weak as humanly possible. I will take the full amnesty. If the general says that we should do this, we will listen to him. Offer concessions and indeed pay his debts. People obviously will still uh, turn very, very angry, but not nearly as much as they otherwise would. And quite frankly, the reality is we are currently owned by the landowners. That is the position that we are in. But we kind of have to start moving as soon as he, Emperor Pedro II uh, here, actually comes of age. Oh, and by accident, we actually got our first mass migration. Large numbers of South Andean people have begin and uh, began migrating from North Peru to Minas Gerais. That is interesting. First of all, this is what we're working for. Now let's take a look at whether this is actually, uh, it's pretty okay, it could be better. There's just not that many people living here, I'll be honest with you. What is this, the North Peruvians? Yeah, North Peru just has a fairly small population, but mass migrations in Victoria Tweaksmod are huge. And this is already satisfying to see. I like seeing, you know, a couple of people coming in. I'm gonna be honest with you though, I think this will motivate me to try and break up this confederation. These people are fleeing from the desperate, desperate attempt to keep Peru-Bolivia together under Supreme Protector Andres de Santa Cruz. Let's start working against them. Let's declare rivalry. We're gonna march into this land, or at least we're going to try and break this up in protection of the Peruvians that are currently spreading into our lands. Uh, this isn't too uncommon, by the way. We also now actually have a journal entry in this. I love the new journal entries that the devs did in Vanilla 1.5, where if, for example, a country goes communist, you will get whites, you know, moving in. So, for example, uh, uh, if France goes communist, then white French will move in, white being the synonym of non-communists here, uh, making it so that your country can be swayed towards their cause. And I think that is exactly what's happening here. The Peruvians are telling us that is a terrible arrangement, everybody hates it. And by the way, you can see right here, we're getting migration, of course, to all of the adjacent states. So, yeah, we're gonna get a couple of new population right here, and I'm a big fan of it. And there you go. I told you this, Diogo Antonio Feo, he has absolutely no tact. He's asking for total separation. Now, there were some interesting conflicts between the Brazilian government and the Brazilian church, because they actually, if I'm not mistaken, Am I wrong here? I'm pretty sure they want to get rid of celibacy, I, if I'm not mistaken here. But anyway, there were some conflicts between the Roman Curia and, of course, the church in Brazil. But this right here, I mean, the intelligentsia might as well sort of catapult itself out of existence because this isn't gonna happen. Take a look at your legitimacy, boy. You're gonna leave this government uh, before long, I think. We'll see what we can do, but I don't think that is happening. The intelligentsia won't be a friend, and quite frankly, the intelligentsia, it has to be said, also isn't as influential with Brazil as it is with other countries, because they don't actually add anything in terms of, you guessed it, migration attraction. And we primarily care about that. Ooh, I don't like this. This is bad. Obviously, it's really, really bad, because, yeah, we are currently from weakness in the face of Albion. The British are doing this to me. I can't believe this. Looking around in the world, we can see France conquering Algeria. That is right on schedule. The British, I assume, yep, there you go. They are invading the Great Qing, and obviously they're gonna win. I mean, they're the British. Just look at this. I am very much looking forward to continuing this. Uh, we are just barely one and a half years in, but that's just because there is so much happening in Brazil. 
next episode, of course, we're gonna be on a bit more of a normal pace, you know, maybe 10, 15 years, you know how it goes. I love this country. Uh, welcome to Brazil. Everybody, please visit Brazil. <sighs> Let me know what you think. Let me know what I have overlooked. And I'll see you later, alligator.